So we are very welcome, uh, very happy to welcome you to, as we call it, the finest podium in the world. Thank you so much, Melissa. Um, I will spare you giving my entire presentation today in the voice of Bob Dylan. Although <laughs> <laughs> that does seem somehow a, a bit appropriate. Um, this is, it's been a lot of fun for me to come back to the Twin Cities. Uh, it's a, one of the three markets as I traveled around the country and the world singing that I really felt like if I ever had a chance to come back, uh, these are the three places I wanted to live, and this was number one. So uh, my phone uh, in the middle of last year started to ring because we had been doing some good work in Arizona where I had served as the general director there for about three years. And the first couple of companies that called, it was very easy for me to say, that sounds lovely, no thank you, and hang the phone back up. And then uh, Mr. Johnson's search firm uh, called. And that one was one I didn't hang up on. Um, and I'm very glad that I didn't. Uh, when I talked to Melissa a little while ago on the phone, uh, I just asked if there was anything in particular that you all would like to learn. This, this community in general is very supportive of arts and culture and education. And I'm aware that most of you probably don't need a primer in what an opera company is or what we do generally, uh, but there are many facets of what we do that most people don't know about. So I'm going to focus a little bit on those today. Um, and uh, I'll begin with just a little bit of, uh, of some history so we can get an idea of where our art form originated and how uh, it came to grow here in Minneapolis. Um, <coughs> see if I can get our, there we go. Um, so, in 1573 in Florence, Italy, a group of folks who were very civically minded, including architects, poets, designers, musicians, um, mathematicians, and lawyers gathered together to try and figure out how they could put together some kind of master art that would not just be dance or music or song or poetry, but kind of blend everything all at once. And they came up with this idea that eventually became opera. And the first opera uh, that was ever created was called Daphne by a composer named Jacopo Peri in 1598. And sadly, that opera has been lost to the ages. We don't know where it went and what happened to it. We just have reference to the fact that it occurred. Uh, the first opera in the United States I thought was fascinating. This happened, of course, uh, during the time of George Washington. It was called Sylvain. And I wonder if you might guess where the first city in the United States uh, that held opera was. Where did Sylvain premiere? Any oh, guesses? Philadelphia. It's an interesting guess. Philadelphia? No, Anyone no, else? No. It's not Minneapolis. <laughs> <laughs> North Dakota. North Dakota. North Dakota. <laughs> Should we keep going until somebody gets the right yeah. one? Savannah. Savannah, 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 Savannah Georgia. <laughs> All good guesses. Well, New Orleans. Oh. It was still under Spanish control, um, bringing over a, a bit of a European art form into the, into the country. <laughs> now, most people think of opera, and they immediately think of the Metropolitan Opera in New York. The Met was created originally as the Academy of Music in 1854 and lasted until 1926. The Met was actually created as a foil to the Academy of Music. There was a set of donors and patrons who didn't really cotton to what the Academy was presenting, and so they thought that they would start their own thing. Uh, it was on about 14th Street originally in 1880, and then the new Met, what we all know as the Metropolitan Opera sitting in Lincoln Center, opened in 1966 with a performance um, uh, with Leontine Price uh, singing the lead role uh, in that piece. Uh, with a new commission to open the new building. Um, interesting to me is the fact that the Met began to tour the United States with very big productions. Stars like Joan Sutherland and Leontine and Luciano Pavarotti and Domingo toured the United States with the Met from, uh, well, they didn't tour in 1898. <laughs> <laughs> a mere twinkle in someone's eye, I'm sure, that, or perhaps not even. But, uh, but those tours started in 1898 and continued through about 1986. Uh, does anyone know where the very last performance occurred here in Minneapolis, uh, at North Northrop Auditorium here? Um, our own Minnesota Opera has a really interesting history. Um, our company was founded as Center Opera. It was part of the Walker Art uh, Museum. It was founded in 1963. 
and it changed its name to Minnesota Opera in 1973 as it began doing some small community performances outside of the Walker's Walls. Uh, there was also a St. Paul Opera Company. The Walker Company really focused on new work. Uh, it opened with its very first world premiere and continued to present a new work every year. The St. Paul Opera Company sort of took its cues from the Metropolitan Opera Tours and began to present things that were big European uh, war horses, things that we know like La Boheme, Carmen, Aida, uh, Tosca, Il Trovatore, La Traviata. Um, and that's what the St. Paul Opera Company did, but on a very small scale. And then in uh, uh, 1976, St. Paul Opera merged with Center Opera and, and became the Minnesota Opera that we know today. Um, we continue in Minnesota with our opera company to produce not only world premieres, but also the classic war horses that we love and have known for hundreds of years. Um, the most recent uh, sort of big acclaimed piece that we developed was Silent Night, um, and that won the Pulitzer Prize for Music in 2011, so we were very happy to add to the city's prominence within our industry. Uh, last season, of course, we presented a, a piece based on a book by Stephen King called The Shining. I'm not sure anyone has ever thought of that before us, creating a horror opera. Um, but we were very excited to announce this piece. That was actually my first week on the job, was the, the opening performances of The Shining. And it was actually not a horror. It was a, quite a good week to start, to start work at Minnesota Opera. One of the things that Melissa and I talked about was the idea that uh, many believe that our industry, meaning uh, classical music and classic art, museums, is an industry in crisis. Part of the reason that I think people believe this is because you open the newspaper on any given day and you read things like New, New York City Opera announces it will close, Philadelphia Orchestra walks out on opening night, Gotham Chamber Opera closes, Pittsburgh Symphony goes on strike, and something a little closer to home here recently, Minnesota Orchestra, labor lockout, not unique. Um, so these are the kinds of things we read about all the time. Um, I got to be pretty good friends in DC with a couple of arts reporters and I was um, extremely frustrated to talk to them. I've known them for about 10 years. I knew them when I was a singer and when I was an administrator there. And I remember asking one of them, I said, you know, 10 years ago when I would read your reviews and I'd read your articles, you were actually a, a very highly regarded critic who knew something about style and history and you sort of weave that storytelling into your reviews and now it's very snarky. And he said, well, yes, how much print space I get in the Sunday paper depends on how many people click on a preview of my article that comes out earlier in the week. And if I'm snarky, I get lots of clicks. <laughs> so then I get to print more stuff that I want, but no, you know, the, the demographic that's reading the stuff in print continues to shrink. So the news that we see, especially online and in uh, social media and television media, tends to be this kind of media that is uh, provoking and is designed to elicit an online response so that these critics and, and writers can get more print space in their newspaper. It doesn't mean that, we're, um, that we don't have our challenges, uh, but as we were saying, if you read those headlines, it seems like the business model's off and that we have a financial problem. And what I told Melissa was, in most cases, you either have an art problem or you have a leadership problem. And in some cases, maybe you have both. But um, part of the reason why we have a different business model is that we don't produce a widget. We don't have a product. Uh, I forget who it was, one of you probably knows, that talked about if you want to be rich, you produce something that someone needs every, every year of their life. And if you want to be really, really rich, you produce a product that everyone must have every day. Uh, we don't have that, per se, in one product. We sell moments, not widgets. Um, and in describing that, when I think about the kind of moment that we sell in, in classic art and in, at the opera, I think a little bit about the fact that we work in a space that looks like this. It's a proscenium theater. It's housed in a building that looks like this. The Ordway is where we do a lot of our main performances. But when I go back in my life and I figure out the first couple of places where I had a shared experience with the same kind of moment that we can create, I think about a building like this, which is the uh, Coliseum at George Tech in Atlanta. I spent, well actually that's not the building, it looked more like this when I was growing up. Uh, this was the uh, Alexander Tharp Coliseum at George Tech. Um, we sat inside in a stadium that looked like this to watch our basketball games in the late 80s, early 90s. 
and I sat somewhere over there. Um, and what I remember about this when I was in high school is that the team had gotten so good that year that it was in uh, almost every game with one of the, its other NCAA uh, uh, teams ended with a halftime, you know, like Hail Mary from the half court. And as soon as that ball went into the air, there was silence. And uh, game after game, I realized that there were these thousands of people in this space and that nobody was thinking about their dog's last, last vet visit or their overdue electric bill or whether their kid was getting into college. They were suspended in this moment of anticipation. And it took you outside of yourself for just a couple of seconds until the ball hit and either went through the, the uh, net or bounced off to the side. And depending on which team you were on, you were either really happy or really honked off. Um, but that moment is what we pay the money for, right? It's not just the technique that you watch on the court or what these singers do on stage, which is Olympic in, in what they're able to do with their voice with no amplification to carry over a 60, 75 piece orchestra in a hall completely unamplified. It's that moment where you get taken somewhere else. And that's what we sell, and it's, it's hard to put price tag on that because it happens individually, and it means something different for everyone. We, however, are the original multimedia art form. I thought back a little bit the other day uh, to when I first remember watching the news. I was about, uh, let's say, six-ish, six or seven, in about 1978, when the news on TV looked like this. Remember that? <laughs> Um, and then somewhere along 1980 and after, we got something that looked like this. And all of the story, we've got the original story that the person is talking about on the news, and we've got, let's just say, a character um, instead of just a reporter, because they all have personalities now. In opera in 1978, you might have seen something like this at the Met. Today, if you come to Minnesota Opera, you might see something that looks pretty close to 1978. I mean, we have color photos now, which just makes it a lot better. But uh, if you think about it, we've got uh, your, fir your first story. There's Mimi and Rodolfo in La Boheme falling in love. You've got your secondary, um, uh, sort of the, your crawl or your closed captioning, if you will, across the top with your super title so you can tell what's going on with the story. You've got your secondary characters, so if Mimi and Rodolfo aren't your type, you can check out Musetta and Marcello as they fight and pull their hair out trying to figure out their life. And down there in the pit, you've got the orchestra, so if you're not a fan of what's going on on stage with all the costumes and sets and the double stories and the super titles, you can always focus in on what's happening in the orchestra. And that's really the beauty of what the Camerata created in 1573, is this multimedia art form. Um, so we're ideally suited for younger audiences, and we're seeing as we continue to produce new work that we have a couple different segments of audiences that get broken out uh, across the time. The balance uh, of what Minnesota Opera has always achieved well is a combination of compelling stories and song. That's, that's really all we do. We just tell stories with, with vocal music. Um, and then balancing that out is a solid charitable support system and a fiscal plan that keeps us on track. Uh, doesn't mean that you hit your goal every single year. There's a lot of tea leaf reading uh, when, you, when you go through the budgeting process. Uh, a lot of formulas, a lot of guesswork, but also a lot of looking at a uh, trend in the past and making uh, what you feel like are reasonable uh, expectations of, um, of support. Uh, this is what your Minnesota Opera looks like these days. Uh, we have over 42,000 folks that join us each year in the Ordway, 24,000 uh, learners. Uh, these are students, uh, grade levels four, uh, ages four through 70-ish plus sometimes, who come and join us all over the state for our education programs. Uh, we have about 1,000 students we serve each year who are in need served through free and accessible education programs. About 600 artists that we engage over the course of a year, about 125 every time we go into the Ordway who are working every night for the audience that's there joined with us. About 40% of those are local artists that we are employing. Um, 370,000 annually served around the state. 165,000 of those are through broadcasts and content streaming online. 
and over a thousand uh, participate in uh, sort of what I call the extracurriculars. Uh, this is our tempo program for young professionals to meet and get together and socialize and share their love of all kinds of art and, uh, and merry making, as, as uh, I like to talk to them about. Um, we also have a resident artist program. This is probably the, the aspect of the company that I'm most proud of because I came out of it. So I'm a, a good example of what the resident program uh, is able to do. We do this big tour every year that's sort of like a classy version of American Idol where, um, and I'm not Simon, um, where we travel around and we listen to about three, four hundred young singers a year and they're auditioning for about six spaces in our program. We have 13 this year, but they can stay for two years, so in any given year there's about half of them that are staying over. So if you do the math uh, every year, it's actually harder to get into our Young Artist Program than it is to get into Harvard or Princeton. Mm -hmm. um, and especially if you're a soprano, which is the most common female voice type, uh, your, your chances of getting in are about a quarter percent. So um, I, I did a study at one point a couple years ago for one of my colleague organizations about what other job takes the risk of having a quarter percent chance of being successful any day they leave their house to go to work. And it says something, I think, about your calling and this, these people's heart and spirit that they get up every day and go to do that because they know they have to. The audience and patron response, really, throughout the company's history, but especially last year, was extraordinary. We sold every single seat available for three of our five shows last year. Uh, this was the Magic Flute, Rosalka, and The Shining. Um, the Shining in particular did extraordinarily well. It was the first show in the company's history that sold out not every, not only every seat, but every standing room seat. And as fast as the tickets were returned because someone fell ill or had to take a trip out of town, they were resold. And we used an airline seat pricing model where the tickets got more expensive the later it went on. So we actually made 118% of our goal for that show in, in terms of our sales. Uh, the New Works Initiative that brings us shows like Silent Night and The Shining um, has been a real key to the health of this organization as it has moved forward in comparison to our sister organizations that produce opera around the country. Um, one of the things that we were very excited about when we looked at our age breakdown is that many of our patrons who've been with us for a long time and are seasoned opera goers have often said, you know, I'm worried about the future and what happens after we go and the, and the, the hall is sort of looks like a sea of cotton candy um, on a Sunday afternoon and what happens when this generation passes on, will there be anyone appreciating opera? The funny thing uh, for me is that having done some music history research is that uh, Tchaikovsky also had that same sentiment in letters that he wrote and Mozart's wife had the same sentiment in letters that she wrote when she was working on publishing Mozart's work. So uh, in, in my experience, it really just takes a certain level of achievement and experience in your life to be able to really appreciate the intricacy of classic art. I don't think the audience is dying, but I do think it's our responsibility to get out there and make sure that people know that we exist in the first place. Um, we saw with The Shining, though, that 41% of our single ticket buyers had never bought a ticket to the opera within the last five years, and 33% of those were under 40 years old. So that was a really good pitch for us uh, to show the board how we were making inroads with a new audience. Now, before we realize how rosy this seems to look, that also means that 41% of our regular audience stayed home from The Shining because they think as a new work it might sound like you're dropping a tray of flatware on the floor. Um, but actually it was very tuneful. It sounded kind of like a movie soundtrack with some classic opera singing to it. But to watch them uh, actually have these stage fights and that axe crash through the door, actually it was a, um, not an axe, a mallet, a croquet mallet like it was in the book, uh, it was pretty exciting stuff. And I really loved being there. Um, so I thought just to sort of uh, end up before we, uh, before we uh, take some questions, if you've got any questions about our business model or what we do, mm -hmm. I thought I'd just give you a glimpse into about 10 different kinds of shows that we've produced lately with a little bit of a soundtrack since I'm not going to sing for you today. <laughs>
take any questions if you've got any. Yeah. Is it a matter of introducing opera at some stage in our educational life that makes it imperative? Because I want to say I was a product of the Robinson <coughs> School District. Don't anybody get upset. Uh, <laughs> and uh, we had a music teacher that was very, very interested in opera. So it started with us fifth and sixth graders, and we'd see an entire opera. And it was just that early exposure to something we'd never heard about that created a lifelong interest for me. Yeah, there, there are actually some studies that talk about the three factors that are important for you to get into opera when you're, uh, when you're growing up. One of them is that you have a particular set of personality traits that makes you genetically predisposed to appreciating art. Um, that's, not, that's not everyone. That might be seven to nine percent of the population who really can appreciate opera because it's built into, their, into them, into their DNA. Uh, one of the other things is that you need about three exposures to any art form like this before the age of 14. Uh, and it doesn't mean that you have to sit through an entire opera three times before you're 14, but you have to have seen it and understand that that's, op that's what that is. This is opera. And then the third thing is that the person that introduces it to you, you will likely stay with it if the person that introduces it to you are so is someone that you care deeply for. Uh, because if it, rem it makes you remember that relationship, um, then it's, it's something that you are inclined to appreciate when you reach a stage of life when you've got a little extra money and a little extra time. Um, if it's someone that you really, if it was a teacher, for example, that you didn't think much of, Correct. you probably wouldn't have had the same experience. Um, so it's, uh, you need kind of all those three, and that's part of what our education programs aim to do, Thank you. is make that connection. Yeah? Uh, about a year ago, you had a production that was on the screen that had the dragonflies projected on yeah. many, many, it was just a riot. It was wonderful. What was the name of it? That was the Magic Flute. Oh, the Magic Flute. And um, that one, I, what I recall is that it was an original production from Europe, from Germany. It was. That was, uh, and that was, I, I was running Arizona Opera at the time that Minnesota brought that production over. It was from the Komischer Opera in Berlin. Okay, so how many of your productions are A to Z created here, and how many are brought in? That's a great question. I, between 30 and 60 percent a season are created here, and then uh, somewhere between whatever the, uh, the reverse of that is, 40 to 70, would be something that we would bring from somewhere else. That was a good one. Yeah, yeah, I like that one too. Very inventive. It was mostly projection work, very different for our artists. Yeah. We would love for you to have a closer connection with your Minneapolis Rotary because we have a network of 35,000 clubs around the world. Yeah, actually, my dad's a Rotarian. Whoa! Um, he was a club president at the Vinings Club and uh, did some national work, I think, too. Um, but I've been around Rotary for a very long time. When I was in Arizona, I went to the Phoenix chapter. And I, you know, I stuck my head in there about once every three months. Uh, I am on the road very often, and it became very difficult for me to try and be there every Friday, but I said, as many times as I can come, I'll stick my head in the door and come. Maybe Mallory could come. Yep. Anyway, my question is, <laughs> my question is, uh, Rotary International, which is the parent for us, sponsors an annual conference, and one of them recently, a couple years ago, was in Australia, Sydney, and I happened to see the Sydney Opera House. I'm dying to hear what, some, what someone like you, with your expertise and experience would say about that particular opera house, well known across the whole world. Yeah, you know, one of the interesting things about some of the, um, the opera houses that we think of as iconic, Covent Garden and La Scala and the uh, uh, Sydney Opera House, which you know I think was most prominently featured in Dory, um, Finding Dory and Finding Nemo, um, uh, they're iconic because every good city has a good opera. Every big international cosmopolitan city with good business and good community has a great opera company. And uh, there was a, we were looking at a study recently about where those opera houses sit and what makes them successful. And part of it, of course, is that they have a large population uh, that, that are drawn to a city center. Uh, all of the opera houses that we think of as iconic, Lincoln Center included, um, with the Met, and now um, uh, Dorothy Chandler right across from Disney Hall in Los Angeles, 
Uh, they're all within about a mile and a half from the dead center of whatever city they sit in. And they tend to sit, that city tends to be either the capital or it tends to be on a coast where they are at least 1,500 miles from any other major metropolitan city. Um, this is, means it's a good place for us because there's us in Chicago right here in the Midwest that have the two big opera companies. We're probably about a quarter the size of Chicago, but we also trade productions with Chicago relatively frequently. We produced a, a trilogy of uh, Donizetti operas a few years ago that fit perfectly on the Chicago stage and went out to Seattle as well, so we're constantly renting back and forth. The thing that's, I think, a little remarkable about uh, the time period in which places like the Sydney Opera House and the Met and Dorothy Chandler were built is the size of those opera houses. Uh, when you go to Europe, uh, the houses tend to seat between 800 and 1,200 people. Um, the Met and Sydney tend to house between 3,500 and 4,200 people, um, making what we do as artists, singing with no amplification, that much more difficult. Um, so from the artist perspective, it can be tricky because we're having to pump a whole lot harder and it's much more athletic when you're filling a space that seats 4,200 people versus a space that seats 800. Um, and I think we're looking at ways now to both perform in the Opera House and in smaller found spaces as well. Um, warehouses and small theaters and uh, parks and things like that that really bring our art back into the community because it's a popular art form. And a friend of mine in New York who runs the New York Festival of Song always talks about the, the fact that there is no such thing as um, popular music because it was all popular in its day. So, you know, the, the lines between what we think of as classical or romantic or disco um, is, is actually very slim because we're singing and performing about the exact same themes that we've always sung about as humans. Um, and I love that very much, but the, the opera houses are amazing. Yeah. There's one right here. <coughs> Whichever. Okay. My question is on the finances side of things, of the budgeting that you were saying. Yep. What percentage do you have, I'm assuming there's some foundations or consistent givers, and what percentage of your budget is made up of kind of what you feel good and solid about year over year consistently versus a uh -huh. kind of unknown figure of whether <coughs> individual donors or ticket sales yeah. and turnouts? That's a great question. So this varies tremendously in our industry, and it even varies when you're thinking about things yeah. like theater versus opera. Uh, theater without the music component has a much broader scope of people that are that are naturally inclined to join. Um, opera in general, our companies tend to be, some of us take in 10% of our income versus earned, uh, in earned revenue. So ticket sales, products, uh, recordings, things like that, and 90% of it can be funded through charitable giving. Um, Minnesota has a much more even-handed um, percentage in terms of the industry, where we have about, I'd say, 65-70% that's charitable and a good 25-30% that's earned. Um, our, our ticket sales in the community for the size of the two cities that we sit in, um, the number of tickets we sell is the envy of most of our sister organizations because we're just a community that supports the arts, and that's sort of embedded in us as Minnesotans. So um, that tends to be about the range. Um, in terms of what we're comfortable with, uh, much easier for me to predict um, probably 75% of either of those sides. There's always an element of uh, risk that you manage very carefully over time. Uh, to make sure that you can bring in that extra $750,000 in charitable giving or that you can sell an extra 15% <laughs> of tickets that you didn't anticipate. Um, but for the most part, it's it's maybe about 75% of it we feel really good about. If we really were going to be uh, incredibly risk averse, we would budget for no ticket sales. <laughs> uh, that's the only number I can absolutely guarantee every year. Uh, is that we will sell something, but, uh, but uh, you never know how a community is going to respond to a given uh, portfolio of shows each season, so it's it's tricky stuff. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm very impressed with your presentation, Ryan, and thank you so much. In particular, uh, you're stressing the fact that, that throughout ages, people have been alarmed or concerned overly so about aging, so-called aging audiences. Two very quick questions. You stress also that that that, that they're they're unmiked. 
Uh, so I was wrong in thinking at Dalberfoot the last fall when Henry was there too that it was that, that they were like it was some sophisticated system that I couldn't tell because they were not. Number two, a chance. I'm curious. Do you know what that 87th county is? <coughs> county. The one that's not, not represented. 86 of 87. Oh. oh. No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, that's uh, we were wrapping into last year's figures, and so that happened. Uh, we got this uh, sort of infographic together right about end of May last year, and at that point, with about three weeks under my belt, I didn't even know my own name. So um, I don't know which county it is, but it'd be interesting to find out. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I got a chance to go to the Magic Flute, and I think I bumped into Dan there when we were there. But fantastic. And I was really surprised by the diversity and the, especially when it came to the, the ages that were there. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, so you kind of mentioned that you were definitely in a niche market. Yeah. So what is your marketing strategy? How do you go about kind of fine tuning and pinpointing? Your... You should really have my chief marketing officer back to talk about that. <laughs> it, is, it is such an intricate dance that he does because uh, for many, many years, uh, probably due mostly to the Met Tour, making us all more under, uh, more aware of sort of the, the big operas that have become part of our culture because you've heard bits of something or else. In a, and so when you're looking at that as the opera audience, our audience is actually split up. If you think about a museum, if we had just one museum of art for the entire state, you probably wouldn't want to make it the Impressionist Museum of Minnesota, or you wouldn't want to make it the uh, Romantic Museum of Minnesota, you'd want to have a wing in which each of those uh, exhibits could exist so that a wider variety of people could come in and introduce themselves to all the other ones that they weren't familiar with yet, or maybe didn't like as much. Um, so when you're marketing, you actually do have to pay very close attention to the people who are your subscribers, who may or may not like new things, or they might like things that they're very familiar with and they want to see them over and over again because it kicks them in the gut at the same place every time, like La Boheme, um, for example. Um, and then there's a demographic of folks that um, don't join us yet. And, uh, and so when you see, this was a, an interesting uh, conversation to have with my board in Arizona, although the board here really gets it, when you see advertising uh, for the opera, uh, many of our board members in Arizona said, I don't like that ad. And I said, we're not advertising to you. You have your tickets. <laughs> so, I so I don't care. <laughs> we did a, um, you know, how many of you have heard an advertisement for on NPR for an upcoming opera that, that sounds something like, Minnesota Opera presenting Romeo and Juliet this weekend at the Ordway. Blah, 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 you know, the love of one man leads her to disaster. Whatever. And you're asleep at the wheel by the time that takes over. So in Arizona, we actually looked at that because, because you know, public radio doesn't allow you to put words like wonderful and amazing into your ad copy because it's not an ad, it's a sponsorship. So uh, we started telling the story legitimately, but we started using some tweaked language. We had uh, an offer, my favorite was uh, Eugene Onegin. Anyone familiar with the story of Eugene Onegin? It's a Russian opera. Sounds like it would be really cold and snowy and depressing. It's actually one of the greatest love stories on stage you'll ever see. Um, we advertised that instead of talking about how he kills his friend for the love of this woman and everything, we advertised it as if he liked it, then he should have put a ring on it. <laughs> Which is true. Um, and we had board members calling us saying, I don't get this. What kind of awful presentation are you going to be making? You've taken this classic opera and you're turning it into something that's like going to be disgusting to us. I said, no, it's a classic presentation. But the people that are calling to buy tickets know the story of the opera before they go. Because yes. who now understands if he liked it, then he should have put a ring on it. He met a girl who didn't put the ring on it. Things went downhill from there. And that's the story of opera. So I think that's, you know, when you're looking at strategy for us, it's, it's all kinds of things like that. Uh, Jim Johnson, who used to be on the board, 
of the Minnesota Opera and is responsible for Ryan being the CEO, as I understand, mm -hmm. told me when I was chatting that Dr. Rheingold is part of this year's uh, portfolio. Is that right? And it's the first of the Ring Cycle by Wagner. Oh. Is that right? And that has a Viking theme to it. Is that right? <laughs> And there's a Viking theme to this role. Commission be here. Thank you. 